Hello everyone, my name is Pixlriffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. Today's episode, we have a subject which is hovering lazily over there. We're going to be talking about bees, and the reason for that is because we have just acquired a pretty substantial amount of copper, and bees and copper go hand in hand. I will explain why a little bit later on, but first of all, you might wonder where exactly you're going to encounter bees. You will find naturally generated bee nests dangling from trees in specific biomes. In this case, the cherry trees up there have them and a lot of cherry groves will have bee nests in some of the trees. You'll also find them in any of the single trees that generate in meadow biomes, the kind of larger open field biomes with single flowers, lighter bluish green grass and a higher elevation. A lot of those will have individual oak trees that you will find bee nests dangling from. They are more likely to appear in flower forests like this one than they are in regular forests, but you will also see some bee nests dangling in regular forests as well. And lastly, mangrove swamps of all places. Because they have that kind of natural swampy insect life vibe about them, are places where you can unexpectedly stumble upon a beehive, although you might have a harder time doing that considering that they are kind of dense foliage-wise. Now, just like in real life, if you disturb the bees and make them angry, then you are potentially at risk of getting stung. So we don't want to do anything to the hive here. We don't need to do anything with the nest or the bees themselves until we have made it safe for us to do so. And for that, we're going to head back to the house and we're going to grab a campfire. We got some campfires earlier in this season by trading with fishermen, but in order to craft them yourself, you just need three logs, a piece of coal or charcoal, and some sticks. Arrange them in the crafting table like so and you will get yourself a campfire. Campfires can be placed in the world basically anywhere. You can even put them inside a completely wooden house and not be at risk of setting anything on fire. They can also be extinguished which makes them kind of a neat looking block. They actually end up looking like a wood pile of sorts. You can relight them using a flint and steel although once again be careful if you're doing that inside a completely wooden house you don't want to set fire to your floorboards by mistake. And in order to pick a campfire back up, you will need a silk touch tool. Ideally an axe, but in this case, I'm going to use a pickaxe. This will return the campfire to your inventory as a lit campfire block. If you put it back down again, it will stay lit. And even if you extinguish it and then pick it up with a silk touch tool again, when you place the campfire back down, it will light itself again. You can extinguish it with a bucket of water as well, incidentally. So that's another option that you have. But if you break the campfire with a non-silk touch tool while it is lit or extinguished, you will just get two charcoal back. While that seems like an interesting way of getting hold of charcoal, it's actually much less efficient than just smelting the three logs that you used to make the campfire in the first place. Another neat use of campfires, though, is their ability to cook food without consuming any fuel. We've talked about smokers and furnaces a little bit in the last couple of episodes, but a campfire will actually let you right-click on it with some uncooked food. Any kind of food that can be cooked, even baked potatoes and stuff like that will count. And after a while, after a while of smoking and you know, just being arranged around the fire like this, these four items will pop off fully cooked. And while it is a little dangerous to step into the campfire, you will take a little bit of fire damage from doing that. All of the items will pop off around the campfire and you should be able to collect them simply by carefully walking close enough. There we go, we got a couple of steaks popping off and there it is, we've got all four of that steak back. While we're on the subject, another fun fact about campfires is that they give off this plume of smoke rising up into the sky. Typically that will only rise for seven or eight blocks before it starts to evaporate. If you put a block directly over the top of the campfire like so, some smoke particles can rise through it. But if you put a block one block above that, even without the block in between, all of those smoke particles will get stuck and the campfire smoke will start to rise again once you've removed any obstructions from it. If you want the campfire smoke to rise even higher, you can place a hay bale underneath it. And now, as you can see, the smoke from the campfire continues to rise and doesn't become transparent until it's two or three times the height it originally was. So it's entirely possible to do really cool things with campfire smoke if you wanted to have beacons on the nearby hilltops, that kind of thing. Anyway, after that introduction to campfires, we are going to use them to help us safely harvest the product 
of these bee nests. If I pop the campfire down on there, the smoke will rise into the hive. At which point we have two different options. We can right click on this bee nest with a glass bottle to harvest the honey, or we can right click with a set of shears to harvest three honeycomb. And the bees will not be aggressive towards us. When bees do get aggressive, their eyes will turn red, they will follow you and attempt to sting you. When they do, the sting will deal a little bit of damage and inflict poison for a few seconds, and then the bee will die shortly thereafter. But in more peaceful times, you'll notice these bees flying from flower to flower, acquiring pollen on them as they do. You'll notice that the pollen even drops off them in the form of these little light particles. And after buzzing around for a little bit like this, they will eventually return to their nest where they will work on making some more honey. Right now, this hive is no longer full of honey since we sheared the honeycomb, but after bees have returned to it a couple more times, it should fill back up with honey again, and we can harvest that for either honey or honeycomb. Obviously, right now we're in an environment where there are a few other bee nests around, and so if I'm getting impatient and I want a bit more honey or honeycomb, I can just simply seek out another bee nest in the area. For example, there's this one here underneath this cherry tree, and it doesn't look like any bees are at home right now, they have a tendency to wander off. Bee pathfinding is a little inconsistent, they don't tend to return to their hives if they end up a little further afield, but with the honey dripping from this hive, I think we'll probably go and get a glass bottle so that we can fill that up with honey. We've got plenty of those lying around from our potion brewing experiments, and honey can be acquired by right clicking, there we go, with an empty bottle getting us the bee our guest advancement. If you look that up in the advancements tab, I believe it's under husbandry, there we go, it prompts you to use a campfire to collect honey from a beehive using a glass bottle without aggravating the bees. So campfires are really the key to safe interactions with bees like this. Now honey is a foodstuff, it will restore a little bit of hunger, but it can be drunk even if you are not hungry because it has the additional effect of relieving the poison status effect. It will only remove poison though, so for other status effects it's important to return to the cows for a bucket of milk, but if you end up getting poisoned by bees and you swipe their honey, you can drink the honey as a last resort to dispel that poison effect. Now, as I mentioned, it seems like the inhabitants of this bee's nest have deserted it. I don't hear any buzzing coming from the hive. There don't seem to be any bees around except the ones that have taken home in the flower forest. It may be that they just had a hard time pathfinding back to it since it was up here in the tree. So with my silk touch tools, this is most effective with a silk touch axe, but I may as well grab it with a pickaxe. We are going to break that bee nest. It looks like it fell down here onto the mountainside. There we go. We have ourselves a bee nest right here. Bee nests are really quite a pretty block. I kind of like using them as a building block occasionally because they've got a nice side texture. Kind of reminds me of the composter block actually. But more importantly, if we're out here and we find some bees that don't seem to be able to make it back to their nest, we can pop down this nest and they can claim it as their own. There is another nest here in the forest, which leads me to believe that maybe some of these bees working around here belong to this this nest, but let's at least gather what we can from this one, and then we'll see if we can breed up a couple of bees so that we can increase the population and have this nest populated as well. Now just like in real life, bee nests occur naturally in the wild, but if we want to cultivate the bees ourselves, we can create our own hives by using some wood planks and some honeycomb across the middle, kind of sandwiched the way you create bookshelves. Those will create bee hives, which look a little different to bee nests, but function almost exactly the same. Much like the nests, bee hives will need to be placed above a campfire if you want to harvest them manually, since the bees will still get annoyed if you end up taking some of their stuff without the presence of the smoke. And so I'm going to craft two more campfires, and we're going to set up a little colony over here. We're going to have the two hives and the bee nest that we gathered in the middle, and we're going to try and encourage these bees from around here to breed. To do that, I'm going to grab some flowers from the nearby flower forest biome. Any flower will do. Bees are attracted to basically anything that you can put out here. And these bees over here have already refilled their hives. They're looking pretty industrious, but this bee right here is now following me around since I'm holding a flower in one of my hands. There we go. We found another one, and now these two bees are following us with our flowers in hand. We're going to draw them back over towards these hives, and we're going to right click on each of them with a flower. That will encourage them to breed, and they'll produce a tiny little baby bee, which actually look exactly the same as the adult bees if you get close enough to them. It's all a matter of perspective. The bees will be encouraged to stay in the area by the presence of flowers, and then they will return to the nearest nest or hive, as the case may be, and when they pop out of the hive again, they will have increased the honey level in that hive by one point. We can actually take a look at this in the F3 debug screen, where on the right hand side there it will say the honey level of the hive we are looking at. These two both have a honey level of zero, as does this one. But if we want to measure that without having to look at all of that 
debug information, we can do that with a redstone comparator. For that, we will need three natural stone, three redstone torches, and a piece of nether quartz. That will get us a redstone comparator, and comparators allow us to measure the contents of blocks, outputting a redstone signal that can be based on how full that block is, or a variety of other properties. In this case, you'll notice that the hives haven't changed in appearance yet, but if I measure this hive using the comparator, you'll notice that it lights up, and some redstone dust back here will allow us to see exactly how full the hive is. The maximum honey level a hive can reach is 5, and right now, this hive is at a honey level of 2. You'll You'll see these two redstone dust here are powered, but the ones beyond that are not. That indicates that the bees have been in and out of this hive twice. When they return to the hive with pollen, they will work in there for a little while, and when they pop out again is when the honey level of the hive changes. Of course, the wandering trader is going to do his best to get in the way of that, but there we go. The baby bee and the adult bee have just popped out of the hive, and both of them have been working in there, increasing the honey level to four. The bees will pay one more visit to the hive, and once they pop out, you'll notice the honey level increases to its maximum, and this hive will be ready to harvest. The honey in there will be at capacity. Bees will also always return to their hive when night falls, so keep an eye on the time and you should see the bees return, and they'll pop out the following morning after we've had a sleep. There we go, it's a good morning from the bees, and our honey level is now at maximum. You'll notice this is reading a 5 signal strength now. The front of the hive looks like it is full up of honey, and you'll notice those drip particles popping out of the bottom as well. So we can right click on that to acquire some honey. Once again, making sure the bees aren't mad at us because we've got that campfire underneath. And the bees will just continue to work in this way, returning to their hives and producing more honey for us. One downside to this behavior, which I believe is still the case, is that whilst bees are working in the hive, their age doesn't continue to tick over and any cooldowns that they have are paused. So it may take a little bit longer for that little bee to grow up into a full size one and for us to be able to breed the two adult bees to increase the population some more. But in the meantime, we can take a look at some ways we can automate the collection of products from these hives, which is another great way of avoiding the bees getting angry at you. By crafting a dispenser, we can have the glass bottles or the shears used on this hive automatically once it produces enough honey. To do that, we can use this comparator signal readout that is tracking how full the hive gets, and we can simply have it wrap back around into a dispenser that's going to automatically shear or use a glass bottle on the hive once it reaches its fullest honey level. To do this effectively, we are going to need some glass, so I'll quickly smelt a small batch of that in this furnace. We're going to attach a plank to the side of this redstone dust, allowing the dust to flow up on top of it. We're going to place a glass block there so that the signal will not get broken by us wrapping it back around onto this block here. From there, we're going to place one more wood plank here. We're going to have the dispenser facing downwards into the hive, and we're going to add the shears inside of that. And then we'll need to go and get a redstone repeater. Adding the repeater on top of here with a block in front of that over the top of the dispenser, we'll make sure that once this signal strength reaches five, it's going to power that block, which will power the dispenser, and that will use the shears to harvest the honey from this hive. This hive over here has now gotten full, so I'm going to harvest that one manually, adding to my supply of honey bottles, which will stack. You'll notice that regular bottles of water don't stack, even though the empty glass bottles do, and honey bottles are some of the only bottled resources which do stack, because once we have four of them, we can craft them into a honey block. And of course, now that I've set up all that redstone, the bees are more interested in filling up this hive than they are that one. Well, I'll just reproduce the redstone over there then. And just like that, the bees have delivered the shears have automatically sheared this honeycomb that I found resting on the floor down here, and hopefully they'll continue to go to that hive so I can continue to demonstrate this effect. But at this point, I am hoping that I can breed the two adult bees again. Yep, there we go, and now we end up with four bees, and we should be able to direct all of those back to these hives. Each hive will only hold three bees at a time, so you'll find that as they go in and out of some of these hives, they will choose different ones, but once the population gets higher than three, they will have to choose a different hive to rest in at night and to work it. Bees with this pollen trail also have a couple of unique ways of interacting with crops. If I leave them over here like so, and I will probably need to replant bits and pieces of my crop field in order to show you this effect. One of the bees has been working in this hive again, so I'm gonna grab one more honey bottle that's adding to the stack in my inventory, 
And once one of these other bees pops out and starts pollinating again, I'll show you the crop effect. There's a bunch of them following me at this point, but only one of them has the pollen. You will see though that as they fly over these crops, very occasionally you'll notice some green sparkles like that, almost as though a piece of bone meal has been used on that square of farmland, and you can see it actually growing the crops a couple of stages. So this is a really fun incentive for creating your bee colony somewhere near your fields of crops, because the bees, as they bring pollen back and forth from the flowers to the hives, are going to increase the growth rate of any nearby crops that they happen to fly over. If you are automating this setup with a dispenser though, the bees don't know who to get angry at considering that the action hasn't actually been performed by a player, it's been performed by redstone components. And so if you're harvesting stuff automatically, it is safe to remove the campfire from this setup. Just remember that if you want to harvest anything manually, it is best to put it back again. Unfortunately, a couple of our bees here have kind of gone walkabout, and this is a tendency they have, which is why you will often find players keeping bees in enclosed conditions, whether that's inside of a building of some kind or even just encasing their entire beekeeping setup in a big glass box, just to make sure that the bees don't end up wandering off in search of distant flowers and not being able to find their way back home again. So in order to limit the amount of directions in which these bees can wander off, we're actually going to silk touch each of these hives, which, if there are bees currently working inside the hive, will bring the bees with us. They will actually be stored as block data for each of these hives and nests that they are working in. So we don't need to worry too much about their well-being. We just need to put these back down somewhere that they are going to be safe. And in this case, I'm going to start breeding them in my attic. It might seem like a bizarre thing to do, but this attic space is going to be kind of perfect since it doesn't really have any exits. It's got a couple of windows maybe, but the bees won't be able to get out of those. And whilst they might try to pathfind to flowers that are planted on the outside of the house, at least for now, we'll be able to breed them safely in here. At the end of every night, they will go back into these hives, at which point if we want to pick them up and move them using the Silk Touch pickaxe, we can do that. And it'll prevent them from wandering off while we try and expand the population, because we are going to build an automatic honeycomb farm today. And while I would love to have automatically harvested honey as well, I think we're going to save that for another day. For now, just know that it is worth doing if you can get hold of four honey bottles, because that will craft into a honey block, you get the empty bottles back, and honey blocks have some really interesting properties. They are kind of a counterpart to slime blocks, but with some differences. For example, if you're on top of a honey block, you won't be able to jump as high as you could from a normal block of any kind. Jumping against the side of a honey block will cause you to slide down slowly, and if you have more than one honey block, it is a lot easier to get the advancement for doing that. It's called Sticky Situation, and it encourages you to jump jump into a honey block to break your fall. Effectively, it reduces the amount of fall height, reduces your fall speed, and therefore means you take less fall damage. In the meantime, though, we're going to get one more set of honeycomb from this bee nest. There we go, so that we can get some more bee hives, because I think these manufactured bee hives are going to be easier to get hold of regularly for use in our farm. We'll pop this last bee hive up here, and we'll continue to breed the bees until all five of these are completely populated, and then we'll just use the four bee hives for the honeycomb farm, and we'll leave the natural bee nest out there in the forest again. But it's also worth noting that the trees in which bee nests can commonly be found in the wild have a small chance to generate a bee nest when one of them grows from a sapling. I think this is easiest to do with birch trees. There is no one tree that gives a higher likelihood than any other of generating a bee nest, and birch trees are the easiest ones to chop down because they will only grow a few blocks tall. They won't be like cherry trees or oak trees, which have much larger variants, and mangrove trees are difficult to manage at the best of times. The one important factor is that the sapling has to be grown within two blocks horizontal distance of a flower. So if you plant flowers at a decent distance all around these saplings, it is more likely that they are going to generate with a bee nest. Although I think the number of flowers you plant around here doesn't increase the chances, I think just having one nearby is enough. Incidentally, if you want to grow any more wild flowers from the area around you, on Bedrock Edition I believe that you can simply right-click any existing flower with bone meal and that flower will spread, but on Java Edition we need to bone meal a patch of open grass. That will turn into a bunch of tall grass and occasionally some flowers. The flowers will always be native to the biome that you're in. So in the case of this plains biome, we're getting dandelions and poppies, which you'll get in most other biomes, but we're also getting some 
oxide daisies, some azure bluettes. In a swamp, you would get blue orchids. In a flower forest, you would get all manner of plants, all different varieties of them. <laughs> Unbelievably, it looks like one of the birch trees I planted out here has actually generated with a bee nest first time. <laughs> that is really quite a stroke of luck. So I'm going to get that from the tree real quick before the bees end up coming out. And I'm also going to deal with this pillager patrol that's just popped into view because I've got villagers over there. I do not want the pillager patrol to tangle with them. Just for safety, I'm going to avoid attacking the captain directly. I'm going to try and set him on fire and have him get shot by any of the other patrol members because hopefully that will prevent me from getting the bad omen effect and accidentally starting a raid near some of my villagers. Okay, well that was a narrowly avoided disaster. <laughs> Back to breeding these bees. While we're waiting for more opportunities to breed those bees whilst they're on cooldown from breeding, I'm going to show you folks the footprint of this farm and it's going to be a very, very simple one to build. We've just got a double chest down here with space cut around it like so. And we're just going to put hoppers facing into the chest either side here, one here, and then we're going to connect three hoppers to this line inputting into the chest. So all of these hoppers are now directed so that anything thrown into them will end up here in the chest. Our beehives are going to go on top of each of these hoppers on the corners and facing into each one of those is going to be a dispenser. We're going to put these like so. We can put some oak planks on this central hopper here and we'll probably put some stairs over the top of this one so we can reach the chest. But I think for aesthetics, I think it'll look good if there's oak on both sides of the farm. We will plant a flower on the grass blocks here and here. And then either side of that, we're going to fill up this area with glass. Glass is going to go over the top as well, but we're going to wait until we place the hives in before we do that. On top of each of these dispensers is going to go a solid block of some kind. We're still using oak planks for this. And adjacent to each of those, facing downwards towards where the hives are going to be, will be an observer. So the redstone output is facing upwards like this. Now remember, these aren't on top of the hoppers. The hoppers are leaving space for the hives to go in there because each of these hives is going to be detected by an observer. And any time the honey level increases, that's going to output a quick redstone signal. We're going to connect the observers to the blocks neighboring them over the top of the dispensers, like so, always towards the outside of the farm, never connected on the inside. Then lastly, we're going to put a glass divider in here, and we're going to keep a couple of blocks of glass handy for when we put the hives in. I'll quickly craft the stairs that I wanted to put in there so that we can still open the output chest. And we're going to wait to put the hives in until night time, because that's the time when we know the bees won't emerge from the hives and fly out of here, meaning we will have time to put the glass lid on the farm, making sure that they are enclosed in this one block space with a flower. And then we're going to fill each of these dispensers up with shears. Luckily, we have a lot of iron that we gathered from that huge iron vein the other day, but if you've already traded with a shepherd, you might be able to buy shears from them, at which point filling up these dispensers is just a matter of having a handful of emeralds on you. Now, if we put a set of shears in the dispenser, it's going to attempt to shear the hive every time the honey level inside the hive changes, which it's going to do quite frequently and in a lot of cases, it's going to fail to shear the hive because the honey won't be ready yet. The good thing about shears in dispensers, though, is that they won't actually decrease in durability at all if they fail to shear the hive. They will only decrease in durability if they are successful. And so with nine sets of shears in here, each with 238 durability, we're going to be getting about 2,000 successful shears, so 2,000 honeycomb is going to be generated. And we're going to be doing that four times, which means the expected output of this farm, once it chews through all of the durability of the shears, is about 8,000 honeycomb. So in order to hold the full output of this farm, once it has gone through all of the shears, we would need several double chests in order to do that. So you can either add some more hoppers and chests below this, or you can simply return to the farm and collect the output regularly. But either way, this is going to generate a substantial amount of honeycomb. In fact, you might be wondering exactly why we need this much honeycomb. I'll explain towards the end of the video. But right now I'm counting 15 bees inside of here. And since we have six hives slash nests set up down here. We only need three more to guarantee that each of these will contain the full population of bees that it possibly can. And that should be our last set of bees bred up. So now all we have to do is wait for night to fall and for all of the bees to return to their hives. Okay, the sun is setting behind the mountain. Dusk is beginning to fall outside and pretty soon we should see the bees start to return to their hives. If any of them get stuck in the nooks and crannies of the roof line here, we can always 
give them a quick nudge out by holding a flower and that'll have them swarming around us, but pretty soon they should all start popping back into their hives for the night. And then we can take action. Yep, there they go. A couple of them are going in one by one. Let's bring this one down from the roof. Let's make sure that they can all access the hives. Perfect. Looks like they've all found a home for the night. There is one left over and there's a few up here in this corner. So let's make sure those end up down this end of the room and like clockwork, they end up going into the hives. Is this one still not finding the right place to stay? There we go. Okay, perfect. So now we can take these four hives. We needed to make sure that all of the bees were inside the hives before we take them because the bees will still get aggressive to you if you break a hive even if you're breaking it with silk touch. And we're gonna head out over to our farm, which I will light up the perimeter of because obviously right now the mobs are out. They shouldn't be doing too much to the villagers, though the villagers are all safe inside of there. But I want to make sure I have a little bit of room to work around the outside here. The most important factor when placing these hives in is going to be making sure that the front of the hive faces inwards towards the center of the farm, because that's what's going to determine the direction the bees come out. They can enter the hive from any side, but they will always leave the hive from the front. With all of those hives in place, you'll notice that the front is facing in this way. This one even has honey in it already. We're going to put the glass over the top of that, and that should be everything we need to do except for getting the shears into place. And in the morning, we will find that all of these bees have left their hives and they are buzzing away happily inside the farm next to that flower where they should be pollinating. Now, one thing to bear in mind here is that bees will still try to pathfind towards other flowers that they can detect in the vicinity. So it may be that we have to go and do a little bit of digging around here just to make sure that there aren't any other flowers the bees are trying to get to. But in the meantime, that will give us some time to craft a bunch of shears, and we can throw nine of those into each of the dispensers around this farm. A single stack of iron will get you most of the way there. You'll need 72 iron total since there are four dispensers, each with nine slots. And in the event that you have a hive that's already full of honey and placing it in here didn't shear it automatically because we didn't have the shears in in the first place, all we need to do is craft a button, place it on there, and there we go. We will shear our first load of honeycomb. So the shears in this dispenser have taken one point of durability, and in here we have our first three honeycomb. What's happening here is that when the shears are shearing the honeycomb, the honeycomb actually generates inside of the block of this hive itself, and that gets pulled out the bottom immediately by the hoppers, which should just transfer everything out to the chest. It looks like the bees here are already hovering around this flower, which means that they are happily going to make honeycomb around that. These bees might still be detecting that flower, but as they pop in and out of the hives, they will readjust their expectations for what they can pathfind to, and you should find them gathering around the flower that they're actually in there with. And after a while, this chest is going to start filling up with honeycomb on a pretty regular basis, so I can be very, very happy about that. I'm not happy about the amount of pillager patrols that are spawning around here, but as long as the captain is disposed of, then it's safe to say those are pretty harmless. <laughs> Oh, there we go, folks. Our first honeycomb harvest has come in. Like I said, it wasn't going to take the bees long to get to enjoy the flowers around them. And anytime they pop back into the hive during the day, that usually means they have had a chance to pollinate. So I did promise you an explanation of exactly why we need this much honeycomb and what all of this has to do with copper. So first of all, one other thing we can do with honeycomb is create some honeycomb blocks. These are just aesthetic blocks. They don't really have any other uses right now, but they are kind of fun to have around. With the addition of a piece of string in a crafting table, honeycomb can be crafted into beeswax candles, which are really kind of nice to have as an alternative light source to torches. If we put those in a crafting table with some dye, we can get candles of 16 different colors along with the regular neutral candle. If you put a bunch of candles on a block, they will actually clump together like this. You can only do that with candles of a single color, but then they can be lit and a cluster of four candles like this will provide about as much light as a torch. It's slightly less, but it's still a really nice atmospheric light source. But as far as copper is concerned, waxing a block of copper will preserve it at its current age, making sure that it's not going to age any further. Right here we have a fresh block of copper that if I wanted to keep that in a build and I didn't want it to change color over time, we can simply right click it with some honeycomb to wax it. If you decide later on that you didn't want to wax that piece of copper, you can simply right click it with an X 
to take the wax off, and you get advancements for both of those actions. Incidentally, you can also craft waxed copper in a crafting interface if you want to do it wholesale. You can do a stack of copper, a stack of honeycomb, and that will get you a stack of waxed blocks, so you don't need to place it all down in the world before you wax it. And finally, new for Minecraft 1.20, the ability to wax signs has been added so that signs can no longer be edited if you end up right clicking on them, which makes it slightly easier dealing with a storage system like this where you're going to be clicking around your chests everywhere and occasionally you might open the sign editing interface without wanting to. Those will also give off this little waxy kind of noise to them to indicate that they are being interacted with but are not currently editable. In this case though you cannot scrape the wax off with an axe so you cannot make them editable again. You simply have to break the sign with an axe and replace it. So Honeycomb has a whole variety of uses and I'm very excited that we now have an automatic farm for it. And now we've introduced bees we'll be able to look at automatic honey farming in a future episode and all of the benefits that honey blocks can provide. But for now the honeycomb is rolling in and that's where we're going to say goodbye from this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Folks, thank you so much for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed this, and hopefully I should be able to get some more episodes out to you real soon once my PC is back from being repaired. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixel Riffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.